won't you stand and sing with us this morning? I can see the clouds rolling. I can feel the wind they try to shake. I will not be moved. My feet are on the ground. Oh, Laura's back there. Um, you can get some information about our church. There's a little connect card that she will give you. If you will just give us a little bit of information, um, give that back to her, and she will give you a lovely gift. Um, but also, just a quick reminder, we will have a text that will go out at the end of service with all of our announcements for you. All right. We're going to spend some time in this next hour worshiping, singing, praying, studying scripture, all that is to draw close to the Lord. All these activities we do are to enrich our life, but more importantly, it's the worship of one, our Lord, our God, our Savior. He's like honey. Uh, as we sing this song, it is about the honey on the rock, how he provides for us. He is why we're here today, is to focus on him. <clears throat> There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, men are on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry, not at all. Everything you need, you got. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. Oh, you. 
everything in life seems to be unstable, it's good to know that we have a rock that we can build our life upon.
tell you that our God hasn't forsaken us. We have a Lord that we worship, and all he asks is that we do is to remember him. That my people who are called by his name will remember themselves and they will pray. Well, you read Chronicles. He's calling us to fall on our knees, people. Turn to him. We've had tragedy and it did bring our country together, but what brings us together is the power of the Holy Spirit and God's love and grace. So we're going to enter in a time of prayer. Just. Just know why we're here this morning and the freedom that we have. Let's pray. Father, I just ask you to invite those who are in the congregation today just to pray, Father, just to stand and lift you up. Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, the salvation we have from you, the love that you have that you've shown us. We thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed. We humble ourselves before you. We come to you on our knees. We just ask that you continue to move in your spirit here in this nation. And as people that you call his own, will stand up and acknowledge you.
said last Sunday, bad things happened. While we were there, I stayed two, two or three hours, and I went back to the headquarters, but I think we had five or six soldiers come in that armory that day. Well, what can we do? What we can do? Little did they know, for the next 20 years, our guard units out in Kentucky probably deployed at least twice overseas. I mobilized twice. I went to Fort Campbell with our artillery unit, I went to uh, Fort uh, McCoy, Wisconsin with an engineer battalion. Bad things happened. So I read an article about the security down at the Texas elementary school that put security around this school. A fence and security guards. Evil things happen. You know, somebody wants to cause harm, they'll stop a school bus and shoot children on the school bus. You cannot stop evil. If not, they'll be on a tower or up in a, a, a building shooting people in a parade. Or somebody can drive through the parade in a car and kill people. Just bad things happen. If not, we do it. Nature causes it. Tornadoes in western Kentucky, floods in eastern Kentucky, California's dry, one place is Just if you read about it, everything happens. <coughs> bad. I got a book several years ago. <clears throat> Why Bad Things Happen to Good People is written by a rabbi, which I didn't totally agree with his thoughts, but he wrote the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, and that's when, when Ann Thomas died, he was six years old, and I read it, and it really just says bad things were going to happen. And we can't do anything about it sometimes. I look there in the audience, and I see some mature Christians that have weathered storms, weathered storms of a cancer, Divorce, addiction, death of a child, a spouse, 
many things. The weather, the storm, and how often I said, how do y'all do that? And I said, well, we grab hold to the rail of that ship and let the captain guide us through this storm. Uh, you young people, storms are going to come. Now, I know what that you can't miss the storm. It's going to be here. So, with the good Lord there with you, you get through the storm. In the 60s, now I date myself a little bit, 68, there's a, a song out on the eve of destruction. Google it and listen to it. But one line in there, it says, hate your next door neighbor, but don't, persist, don't forget to say grace. And how true is that today? I cannot control what's going on overseas. I cannot control what's going in Louisville. Hundreds some people are murdered, but I do can control what I can do with my next door neighbor. 2,000 years ago, God saw this. He says, those people cannot get out of this mess by themselves. I'm going to send someone to help them. So he sent Jesus Christ here to walk on this earth to save us. Salvation. And we're saved by grace. It's a gift. We have a hard time accepting a gift. Uh, Labor Day, we went out to eat. Stacy, Sally, and Avery, and two of his friends went out to eat. It's the ponies. I was going to pay the bill. I always pay the bill. Well, before I got up there, one of these young men paid the bill. And I said, no, don't do that. I said, it bothered me. Did you know what? He paid the bill. Why not just say thank you and be done with it? So today, I'm going to just say this. Jesus came here to save us through grace. Let's just say thank you and go on and do what we should do. We do not deserve it. We're unworthy. But Jesus did it for us. He gave his life for us. Let us pray. Father God, we just say thank you for your son Jesus Christ. You sent him here for us, Father, and we thank you for that. And right here in this communion, we break the bread and the cup just in remembering what he's done for us. Again, we remember the people that suffered through 9-11 and are still suffering today. In your son's name I pray. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Glad you're here with us this morning at Cornerstone. I hope you've had a good week and a good weekend. We had a especially nice weekend. I got to have my uh, daughter and son-in-law down, and it was we we had a great time, a nice dinner last night, but just barely. Um, because anybody else, any guys in this room, you ever had that that thing where when your wife's planning something and she's talking and you kind of zone out a little bit? I'm going to confess. Uh, she was planning the dinner, and I heard we, you know, they were talking about salmon one night, chicken one night, steaks one night, all the vegetables she was going to fix. It was a great dinner, but I missed the part in there where I was supposed to grill the steaks. Um, and, and almost almost didn't come home in time to do the work that I was supposed to do. It's really bad when you come in on the end of a conversation, isn't it? You know, when you, when you miss out on something in the middle, there's often some important stuff in the middle that we miss. Like, I was putting together some furniture <coughs> one time, and two of the pages got stuck together, and the steps weren't numbered, and I didn't notice it. So I went right on, and I don't know how many steps I skipped, but two pages worth of it. When I got around to a little bit later, it's like, what am I doing? It didn't, didn't make any sense. When you skip something in the middle, if you miss out on some information and you don't get everything in context, it can cause some severe problems in our ability to be able to do what we're supposed to do. And over the next few weeks, that's what we're going to be looking at is some scriptures that have been taken sometimes out of their context. And when we don't understand everything that's around them, they, they get twisted in our lives and in our mind. And we're going to look at scripture patches that passages that often get misapplied, and misapplying something can cause a whole lot of problems. I had a friend whose uh, father misapplied his acting medication, mistaking it for his father's hemorrhoid cream. Misapplying things can be a real pain in the backside, we'll say. You can laugh. All right, I'll give you a second on that. Hey, can you turn the lights up? I can't see anybody. And I'm just like, I can't, there we go. Now I'm seeing some faces. I can actually tell if you're connected with me a little bit there. Um, but, you, you know, when we misapply Scripture, it can create a lot of problems. And it creates some really warped views that Satan will use to twist your life and even separate us from God. Rolling Stone sang a song that you can't always get what you want. I think that's probably true, but what Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says is, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And I certainly would not put more trust in this lyrics of a Rolling Stone song than I do in the Bible. But have you ever found that that doesn't always pan out the way that you expect it to? You ask, but you didn't really receive. You saw it, but you couldn't find. You, you knocked, but the door didn't seem to be open. And here's this promise we have from God. But what our experience sometimes teaches us is that it doesn't always work that way. Garth Brooks made famous a song, Unanswered Prayers. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And, you know, we may think that that's true, but I don't think God really doesn't answer prayers. I think God gives us about three different answers to prayer. Some are yes, some are no, and some are grow. And what we have to learn to do is understand when God is trying to help us grow. And what Jesus does from Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8, into the next few verses in verse 9, he says, he, he continues on teaching, Which of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, I, there's lots of times, though, that we go through and we pray for something, but we don't get it. And you've been asking, but there's no answer. At, at least you didn't, get asked, you didn't get what you asked for and prayed for. And God could be saying no. He could be telling you to grow. But a lot of times we think if we're just persistent, if we keep asking. I mean, Jesus even gave us a parable of the persistent widow who continued to ask, continued to pursue God, and, and got what she wanted, but... So often we will ask and we'll see and we take this passage and we think, if I'll just keep asking, I'll just hold on, I'll keep begging God to give me this thing, then it will happen. But God is a good father, just like many of us. If you've raised kids, you, you know that just because your kid wants ice cream for breakfast, you don't get to do that. It's not what's best for them. Just because they want to stay home from school, you know that they can't do that. They need to go on and go to school. They don't get to just stay home and they, can't, they have to go to work. And you know, on Sunday morning, you, you tell them, uh, as Rhoda does me all the time, you've got to go to church today. Uh, and you, you have to get up and you have, there's things that you do because you need to, and a good parent lets us know those things. 
But that's not really what this verse says. <coughs> it says, ask and you'll receive. And so what's, we have this dilemma. Either this verse is a lie or perhaps it's been misapplied. And so we start looking, as we should, anytime we begin to study Scripture, if something that we don't understand, something we should look to other parts of Scripture to begin to try to understand that. And so we look to other places in Scripture where prayer is talked about. And we turn to the book of James, and James writes in James chapter 4, verse 3, says, When you ask, you don't receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you can spend what you get on your own pleasures. And we learn from James here that we need to not be selfish with our prayers. But what if we're praying for something that isn't selfish? We're praying for a child who's been diagnosed with cancer to be healed. We're praying for wars to stop, for people to be protected, for good things. And it's not even about us. It's not selfish, but yet it still doesn't happen. Well, maybe then we need to go to like Isaiah 59, where Isaiah tells the people there that God doesn't hear our prayers because of sin in our life. He warns, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So sin can hinder our prayers. God doesn't hear because we're separated from him by our sins. And so... And so it's, maybe it's a, a lack of faith. Jesus told his disciples so many times, you, you don't have because you don't have faith. Why, why do you have so little faith? And, this, and we begin to look at these things and we're saying, well, I'm praying for something that's good and it's not selfish and, and <coughs> I, I don't know of any sin in my life, but maybe there's something. And, and a lot of times we'll go through life because we're praying and asking for something, but we're not getting the answer that we expect. We begin to doubt the strength of our faith. We can question our standing with God. Why isn't God doing this? Why are these bad things happening? Or perhaps there's this sin we need to confess. But, and, and there's some people, and I talk to them, and they'll ask me to pray for them. And I'll say, well, you, you know you can pray yourself. And they're like, yes, but I just don't feel like I'm good enough to pray. And so this, this idea that if you're good enough, God will answer your prayers permeates some people's minds. Maybe you felt that way yourself at some point in time. And you think, man, if I was just better, if I, could, if I could straighten my life out, if I could get everything right, then God will answer my prayers. But that's not really the way it works either, is it? God doesn't need us to have everything straight. The power of our prayer is not in our power of our goodness, but in His faithfulness. It's in His goodness. But have you ever hit that point where you feel like your prayers are useless? Why, why even bother praying? I mean, as... As Richie shared earlier in his prayer, God already knows what we need before we even ask. So, so why bother praying? Why ask God for anything? Isn't God just going to do what he knows is best anyway? He's got a plan and he's, he's all-knowing and all-powerful. So God's going to do whatever he wants. So, so why should I? Why bother to ask? Why bother to seek? Why bother to knock? What's, what's the point? And many times we withdraw into this point in ourselves to where we don't talk to God. We don't know what we ought to pray for. We, we feel like our prayers are just going up to the ceiling. We doubt our faithfulness. We doubt if God hears us. We doubt God's love for us. And you know, this happens because we didn't pay attention to the whole context of when Jesus told us to ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be opened. When you really look at the entire context, Jesus is giving this information in Matthew chapter 7 towards the end of this enormous sermon that he has given uh, called the Sermon on the Mount. And, and what we so often do when we study the Sermon on the Mount, because since it starts in Matthew chapter 5 and ends at the end of chapter 7, when we study it, we break it down into these little chunks and we take this little piece and this little piece and this little piece and we, and we study that part of it, but we never really get the message of all of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus was a masterful communicator. He gave them so much information here. It's, it's overwhelming. But he still had one main point that he wanted people to get. And the main point is, I'll just go ahead and tell you, is he's telling us that we need to be righteous like God is righteous. You see, the Beatitudes, they start with telling us that our, our blessings is being like God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who mourn or are persecuted, for they will be uh, known by God. And, and so God does that, and, and he's telling us that we should have a heart like God does. But in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus just point blank tells us, 
You should be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Boy, that, that kind of sets the bar a little bit high, doesn't it? But he goes on in Matthew chapter 6, don't strive for the things of this world. Don't try to, uh, don't, don't worry about the things of this world. And he goes into the end, in Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be given to you. And he gives us instructions on how to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That it should be God's desires and God's will that would be done in our lives. And then he says, don't judge, because God hasn't passed judgment yet. We shouldn't be thinking about how other people are failing. We should just be simply understanding that God is at work. And Jesus closes out this sermon by saying that wise people will take everything that he's taught here and apply these teachings as, as someone who builds their house on the rock. That these teachings will be a foundation for us. But throughout it all, he's pointing us to one thing, that we need to be like God. It's pretty simple. We need to pray to be more like Jesus. Now, if we take that context, that everything that Jesus is pointing us towards is that we would strive and ask to be more like Jesus, then when he offers these verses in 7 and 8, and he says, ask and it will be given to you. If we'll ask that we could be more like Jesus, then in God's grace, we're clothed in Christ. That's what Paul teaches us in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You were all baptized into Christ, and so you were all clothed in Christ. And this means that you are children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. In this, we also gain the strength of the Holy Spirit to help us. And if you ask to be like Jesus, then you can be assured that by grace, God will give you what you ask. Because he's already accomplished it on the cross. And then he encourages us to seek but what is it that we need to see? How does, God, it's how does God want us to grow in our life? How does He want us to grow to be more like Jesus? What are the things in your life that you need to change? I always love the statement, God loves us just as we are. But too much to let us stay that way. He's called us to something better. So when you seek, you're looking for something. What is it that God wants you to change in your life that you can become more like Jesus? And if you seek what you need to change, God will point it out to you. And He'll show you what you need to change. He'll show you how you need to adjust your life so that you can begin to follow Jesus. Matter of fact, the other time He used the word seek in the Sermon on the Mount is when He told us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then he says, knock. God wants us to come to him so that he can help us. He's, he's ready to open the door just as the father of the prodigal son was. The, prodigal, the father of the prodigal son took off running to his son. He didn't wait for the son to come and apologize and to make everything right. He wanted so much to share the riches of who he was with his son because he loved him so much. And God is excited to sh to to lavish upon us the riches that are His in this world even. And He'll give us all that we need, but the goal is that we would be like Jesus. And Jesus isn't promising that God will do whatever you want, but that He'll supply instead whatever you need in order to become more like Him. That we would be shaped into the image of God's Son. You know, a lot of times we don't know what we ought to pray for. We'll pray for sickness. We'll pray for healing. We'll pray for problems in, in the world. Today we took a moment to pray for our country and that people would turn their hearts. But what we need is for Christians. People called by His name to humble themselves and turn and seek His face. That we would be changed. And that's what we're ultimately being called to do. And Jesus isn't promising that God will do whatever you want, but that he'll supply what you need to be able to become more like Jesus. And for us to be more like Jesus, as he talked throughout the Sermon on, on the Mount, is really too big of a job for you to be able to handle on your own. Now, I love watching Kaylee. She has, her favorite stuffed animal is this giant giraffe that was faith that was sitting on Faith's bed. The giraffe is about eight inches taller than Kaylee is, and she can't really carry it, but she'll drag it off, and she drags it through the house and trips over it constantly and will fall down. And she's so cute trying to carry this giant giraffe around. But I think that's what a lot of us look like whenever we start trying to carry the image of Christ around with us. And if we're going to make ourselves like that, we're tripping over it all the time because we just can't do it on our own. 
I read a story about a father one time who was who had fixed a new sandbox for his son in the backyard. And he was watching out the kitchen window as his son was beginning to play in the sandbox. And, but what the son discovered was that underneath the, underneath the sand, there was this large rock that was there. And the, and the boy wanted to move the rock, so he started digging the sand out from around the rock. And he, he, got, and he got his tools and he was trying to pry the rock up. And he was trying so hard, but he couldn't move the rock. And the father watched for a while while the son continued to struggle with this rock. And then finally he walked out and said, son, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm trying to get this rock out of this sandbox so I can, so I can clean it out and have a better place and, and, and everything will be better. And he said, but I can't get it to move. Dad, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing. And he started to tear up. And his father said, you've not done everything you can do. And he said, Dad, what else can I do? And he said, you can ask me. And the father reached down and he grabbed the rock and he took it out of the sandbox. So many of us are trying to fight our way through to prove ourselves to become what God has called us to be. We think that we're going to somehow become like Jesus by our willpower. That we can change ourselves. But it doesn't work that way. There's going to be obstacles to becoming all that God wants us to be. And we try to get there on our own terms. We try to get everything Right, and we impose all these rules on ourselves that we begin to follow. And you know what Paul says about that? He says such regulations have the appearance of wisdom. It looks smart. All these self-imposed worship that we do. But it's also false humility. They lack any real value in restraining the sensual indulgences. You see, you can restrain your selfish desires, and you can. Be, but when you do, you'll start to become proud of how good you're doing. But the real problem is those desires still remain, don't they? We can't change ourselves, but God can change us. We try to control ourselves, but we can't change ourselves. But God can change us. And the key to being righteous, to being the righteousness of God, is that we would ask. Seek and knock for God's help in our lives to be more like Jesus. Because you're not going to manage it on your own. You may control a few things for a little while, but it, you're going to need God's Holy Spirit there to help, to reshape your heart. And that's the promise that God gives us is that the Holy Spirit is there to intercede for us. We talked about this Wednesday night as we were talking about prayer that... In Romans 8, 26, 27, we have this promise that in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness... We don't even know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. You see, it's God's will that you be transformed into the image of His Son, and He gives us the Holy Spirit to shape us, to change us, and God will be with you to help you mature, to become like Jesus. That is the promise of Matthew 7, 7. Is that if we ask God to help us to be like Jesus, He will, and God wants to help us change. Unfortunately, most of us pray for God to change the circumstances and not us. And here's the thing. There is no guarantee in Scripture that God will change the circumstances. We talked about this a little bit last week. But if God was ever going to change the circumstances for somebody because they were a good person, I would think that Jesus would have topped that list as someone that God would change the circumstances for. But when Jesus stood in the garden praying, that God would take this cup from him. God didn't do it. And you see the bottom line is God is not going to answer any prayer that goes against his will. But as Jesus prayed, not my will but yours be done. We need to understand that God's will needs to be done in our life. And even if we're doing everything right, there is no sin in our life. There is nothing hindering our walk with God. That doesn't mean that God is going to answer a prayer that goes against his will. He will not do it. God may not change the circumstances, but he'll always change us. I saw this little quote that I need to share with you. It said simply, I prayed for strength, and God gave me challenges to make me strong. I prayed for wisdom, and God gave me problems to learn to solve. I prayed for courage, and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked for love, and God gave me people to help. 
You see, God answers our prayers, but not always the way that we think He will or the way that we would want Him to. But we need to pray that God will continue to shape us because each of those answers to prayer was designed to shape us into the image of God's Son. And God will do amazing things in our lives when we turn ourselves to Him. So the challenge today is that when you pray, that, that you will start a new aspect of your prayer. Instead of just asking God to forgive you of your sins, ask God to shape you into the image of His Son. That you would become more like Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, though, that's a dangerous prayer. Isaiah remarks and reminds us that God is the potter and we're the clay. Do you all remember singing that, that song? Change my heart, O oh God. It says, you're the potter, I'm the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. When I was in middle school, my, my family ran Bivy Pottery out uh, close to Waco, uh, Kentucky. It was the, it was the oldest uh, pottery, family-owned pottery in, 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 the, in the state. I, somewhere, I think, this side of, I, I don't remember. But it was an old pottery, and it had always been a family. So I went out and did this book report on it, and they brought in the clay, and they taught me how they make the clay. Have you ever watched pottery be made? They take this lump of clay, and it's kind of hard, might be a little stiff, and they throw it down on the wheel. And, and then they begin to knead it. And I watched him as he kneaded, and he punched, and he hit, and he pulled, and he felt slammed, and he broke, and he worked, and he threw water on it. And, he, and man, it was this muck mucky, miry mess, but he worked it, and he shaped it, and he broke it down until it became moldable. You see, if you want to be shaped into the image of God's Son, then the bottom line is, is you better be ready for God to do some hard things in your life. He's going to break you down somehow. But as he does, then he'll begin to shape you. And as it begins to shape us, all of a sudden, all the muck and the mire, the, the water begins to wash away the filth. But before you're going to be finished, you're going to have to go through the fire, just like the pottery sits in that pottery kiln, and it gets, it gets baked. And I, I think a lot of us cease to become like Jesus because the road is too hard, and the conditions are too tough, and we're too weak to allow God to do the work in our lives that He needs to do, and we'd rather just stay like we are. We're more comfortable like this. We've got enough Jesus to feel good, but not so much that we're being challenged to be different. God has something greater that he wants to be able to share with you. And that's what Matthew 7, 7 is all a promise of. That we aren't left to our own abilities, that we don't have to remain this mound of dirty clay but if we ask, seek, and knock, then God will shape us into the image of His Son. We'll be tried by fire, but you'll also be sealed in the Holy Spirit. And it's not an easy process, but when you pray, you can always, you, while you may not always get what you want, if you pray to be like Jesus, you'll always get what you need. And so that's the challenge. Are you ready for it? You see, most of us, like I said, we're, we're more comfortable staying right where we're at rather than really praying that prayer. But if you will ask, if you will seek, and if you will knock, then God will answer the prayer for you to become more like Jesus. And the glorious riches that are awaiting those of us who are shaped in the image of His Son are beyond anything we can even imagine. And the blessings were not just for heaven one day, but they'll be yours and your family. Would your family not be blessed if you handle things more like Jesus did? If you had the patience, the forgiveness, the grace within your family? If you, know, if you had the confidence to be able to overcome the obstacles that come at you in life? Make that a part of your prayer each day. God, make me more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your grace, for your love, and for the power of your son Jesus and the hope that we have through his grace that we can be shaped into the image of your son. That we would become people, Father, who are less like the world around us, but instead we'd be transformed, as Paul writes in Romans 2, by the renewing of our mind. As we study, as we seek to become what you designed us to be. Lord, we thank you because you don't leave us to do this on, your, on our own, but you have promised the presence of God's Holy Spirit to shape us and to make us what we do need to be.
And so, Father, I pray that as, as we leave here today, that we will go with a commitment, that we will look at every opportunity, every situation that comes along, and, and just simply ask, how can we do this more like Jesus would? And that you would shape us and change us. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. I'm going to invite you to stand with us, but if you, if you know that you need to be shaped more into the image of Christ, then we'll have elders that will walk through Scripture with you to talk to you about what it looks like to be able to be more like Jesus and how He might lead. But let's sing this final song as a commitment and a recognition that we just need to be less like me and more like Him. There's a QRS code in the back of your chair as well as in the bulletin. Take an opportunity to look at that, scan it, uh, and that way you can receive all the information and news you need to know and be uh, in front of the bulletin or what's going on here at the church. So let's prepare our hearts as we go out today. As we pray, uh, let's think about uh, your brothers and your sisters and the neighbors who may be suffering on today on 9-11, but 
as Warren talked about, we walk according to the Spirit, and let's be the kind of light that He has called us to be. Father, I just pray I just lift you up. We want to make it more about you and less about each other, and less about us, rather. And Father, we want to love each other like you've called us to. Uh, Father, we want to uh, <coughs> love the Lord our God with all our heart and our soul and mind. And, uh, as we come before you, Father, in prayer, uh, we want to lift you up first and then seek the kingdom of God. Pray this in your name. Amen. Y'all have a great week. <laughs>